Hi, uh, my name is Sebastian McKenzie. I just moved here around nearly two months ago. Um, I work for a company called Cloudflare on web content optimization. Um, so measuring website performance and optimizing code and stuff like that. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about Babel. Um, do any of you use Babel with Ember CLI? <laughs> Have any of you disabled Babel after you've created a new Ember CLI application? <laughs> yeah, be honest. <laughs> um, well, you'll find out. So Babel is a JavaScript transformer, um, JavaScript compiler. So you put JavaScript in and you get JavaScript out. Uh, kind of the popular use case for it is as an ES6 compiler, um, but it can do a whole lot of other stuff. So this is, so there's a plugin architecture that allows you to hook into this pipeline that allows you to transform JavaScript. Um, so yeah, transpilation is the common use case. Um, it's how Babelor started out, but it's kind of slowly becoming more generic. Um, so how does this work? Hopefully this will give you more context if you actually don't know what it is. Um, so you've got some source code that you need to, you want to transform, you want to do something with, um, and you need a, for a, a structure to represent this code. Uh, and you represent it with an AST, um, stands for abstract syntax tree, where each component of your source code is um, basically an object or a node on this tree. Uh, and all the different properties of your code are represented in something that can be inspected. Um, an easy way to visualize this data structure is via a tree. Um, it's the T in AST. Uh, and so here you've just got, your, it's the previous source code where you've just got a program uh, and a variable declaration and a whole bunch of nodes coming off that. Um, and so now that you've got some context of what an AST is, these are kind of the three parts of Babel. Uh, you turn the code into an AST, and then you manipulate that AST, and then you get, and then you, you transform it so you infer stuff about what the code actually does based on some of the properties of it. So you've got a, a class, then you know that's a class, and you can like compile it to um, previous old code that works in uh, older browsers. And then when you transform it, then you pass it back onto the code generator, which turns out AST, the manipulated AC structure back into code that you can execute. Um, and so this is kind of if each part was proportional. Um, most of the Babel is in the transformer or the transformation layer. Um, and this is important since, so oh, this is, oh, so this is traversal where you've got an AST um, and you need to <coughs> visit it. You need to manipulate it in some way. So traversal is so you would go to each node and run, the, the visitor would then visit it and run some code over it. Um, and then you do this for each element in the tree, so going down. And then at any time uh, when you're visiting this, you can add new nodes or remove them. Um, and so this can be kind of tricky. So if you're visiting some nodes or some part of your code and you replace or remove parts of it, then sometimes it may result in invalid code. Um, and Babel's kind of smart in the way that it, it transforms it, where it's contextual, so it understands JavaScript semantics and kind of what JavaScript, what your code actually does. Um, and this leads to kind of some smart transformations. So um, something like this. So here, this is an array destructuring. It's a new feature um, in ES6. So here, it would call calculate coordinates. And then the 0 and 1 index would be assigned to the x and y variable. Um, and so this would be desugared into something like this, um, where it says it just executes and then just assigns the zero and first index. Um, so this is an array destructuring assignment in a statement position. So what if you've got it in an expression position like this? Um, well, if you ran that exact same transformer over it, you would get this code, uh, which is obviously invalid. Um, and so this means that you then have to basically special case each instance where a certain syntactic construct might appear. And so this leads to really tedious transformers where the code is like very verbose and you need to basically replicate each possible position where that thing could appear in. Um, so instead, Babel kind of shifts that checking logic into the core where that exact same transformer would result in this code. 
Um, so it can infer you're replacing a, an expression with a list of statements and then explodes it, uh, retaining all the original kind of semantics and what it can, what it actually means. Um, so this is also handy for removal. Um, so you've got just a binary expression where you're plussing left and right hand side together. And if you wanted to remove the right hand side, then you would typically end up with something like this, um, which is also invalid. But since it's aware of what JavaScript means, it knows that you're replacing one side of this binary expression and it will result in invalid code. It just turns it into the left hand side. Um, so I figured I'll just demo and go through like some of the possible ways and kind of some of the, the use cases of um, Babel. Um, so how many of you use something like Uglify.js to minify your code? Yep, yeah, it's basically the more common one. Um, eventually in the future, um, I kind of hope for minification plugins to be built on Babel. Um, so the goal of Babel now is to kind of be a generic transformation thing. So it just, it's just a JavaScript compiler that stuff can be built on top of it. Um, so stuff like uh, yeah, minifiers or uh, module bundlers and stuff like that. So if like JavaScript's becoming a really increasingly evolving language, um, new features being added to it. And if a new feature is added, you have to wait for all the different kind of parts of your stack to like the different tools that you use that uh, modify or lynch your JavaScript, um, they need to be updated to support this. But if it's all built on a common platform, <coughs> then it means that it can all work um, as long as the core thing, which is Babel, um, supports it. Um, and so one of the things I've been playing around recently is uh, dead code elimination. Um, so if you just have something like this uh, normal function, um, so here you see that it's actually compiled it, but it's determined that foo isn't actually used so I can get rid of it. Um, but if you actually just reference it, then oh. uh, then it determines that you only actually use it once and it inlines it. But if you were to use it twice, then it would just keep it um, as is. So this is kind of something that Uglify already does. But the way that this is kind of written, it, it's an extremely simple plugin that um, could eventually be like pushed out to NPM that you could then include in your stack relatively easily. Um, uh, so it also like really simply just does stuff like um, if you just have another call after that or something, it determines that it, that code is then going to be reached. Uh, this is like you may be saying like wh why is this useful? Like I don't write code that doesn't actually get used or executed, um, but Babel also has another transformer called uh, constant folding. Um, Uglify also does this to some extent, but it's kind of not as smart with it. Um, so for example, it allows the compiler to to statically evaluate um, expressions that can, it, it can determine a constant. So if you were to just do um, then it can determine, oh, hey, you've got foo and bar uh, assigned or declared in scope, um, and it can infer that that will always be three, so it executes it there. Um, so this could lead to stuff like just smarter minifying, where even though this may be fairly simple and you won't, it, it's not really optimizing the code, it's more minifying it, so it's smaller to send uh, across the wire. Um, and so then you can, like, it can support like a whole array of like different kind of expressions. Um, especially anything that just includes immutable kind of data, it can kind of handle in a really smart way. Um, and so these are some of the ways in which kind of having a platform for this where there's a lot of like smarts and stuff in the core can lead to kind of some really complicated stuff done very easily. Um, and another thing that I've been working on recently, B, um, I'll just get the code up. So we have this set of code. Um, so something that you may want to do that leads to kind of more smart and sophisticated transpilation or compilation of your code would be type inference. So knowing the types 
of certain variables um, can lead to stuff like uh, just, just smart minification. So if you can infer that something is of a certain type, then you can change the way in which you compile or change that. Um, so this code would be if you, um, so internally Babel's representation of it would be um, something like this. <coughs> so here we've got the possible values or types that this um, expression will currently be in. So it can infer that um, in this case that foo can be a string or an array. And in this case, it can actually determine that it's just normally, um, it can only be a string since it's assigned right before it. But it's kind of like, it'll, it'll get there eventually. Uh, it's very limited in kind of some of the stuff it can do. But in the future, once it's more solidified um, and it can do stuff like inferring the types between files, um, this will allow for much smarter uh, minification and translation. Um, and Ember CLI is being partly rewritten and most of the, the JavaScript transformation stuff is being moved into Babel plugins. So they could potentially utilize some of this stuff um, to make your Ember applications uh, compile into smarter JavaScript, faster JavaScript, or a smaller JavaScript. Um, and yeah, so there's kind of a lot of potential for stuff like this, especially just a smart thing that's aware of what your code does. Um, that's very generic. Uh, so another thing as well is that there's a, so um, have any, do any of you use JS Hint? Yep, uh, do any of you use decorators <coughs> as well with your code? Try them out. Sort of, yep. So Ember is slowly <coughs> moving to this. Um, Yehuda Katz is currently championing a proposal for JavaScript where they implement this concept called decorators um, that replaces a lot of the object model of Ember to use native classes. Um, and so since it's very experimental, um, if you try to lynch your code that uses decorators, it's just not going to work with JSHint. Um, but if there's a, another linter called ESLint that has a Babel plugin that allows you to lint any of your code that's Babel compliant uh, with ESLint, because it uses the Babel parser to parse your code. And it can, uh, yeah, so, it, like as long as the tool supports Babel, it can kind of support anything Babel does, um, which means, yeah, less work for everybody. And if JavaScript's moving to this increasingly evolving language, then kind of there needs to be something that keeps up with that evolution. Um, yeah, so that's kind of it. Um, does anyone have any questions? If they're still confused on what Babel is, I didn't do such a good job explaining it. <laughs> Um, so it started around early October last year. Um, yeah, it started as a project called Six to Five, um, where I just wanted to learn about compilers and parsers, um, kind of how they work, because I realized that was kind of a large gap in my knowledge that I didn't understand. Um, and then slowly it's kind of evolved over time to support um, the entire ES6 standard, so you can compile it to just code that runs in any browser um, right now. Um, and so yeah, it just slowly evolved into something where kind of built up this ES6 transformation layer and then realized there's kind of a lot more potential for something like this where um, other people can utilize some of these parts to do some cool stuff. It's, it, the, the state Babel has got to is starting to look almost like LLVM and it's kind of the, the level it operates at, the yeah. things that you can build on top of it. Is that something you've been inspired by or looked into? Yeah, so it's also like, I kind of see this sort of being like GCC for JavaScript almost. So right. you can like apply like specific optimizations on your code. I know you may think like, oh, browsers don't they already like optimize my code, aren't they like extremely good at that? Um, well, it, Browsers can't really be lenient on your code. Like if you say you want to do something, then it has to do that. Um, even if, so if you can transpile or uh, uh, compile and transform it in a way that gives the exact same result, um, just it does it in a different way, um, then it'll be like much faster. So only you can kind of tell the browser engine to be more lenient. Like 
Um, yeah, and so that's kind of where I see that going, where, yeah, that answers your question. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, um, Yehuda's currently got the RFC open for um, the release process of Ember. And in, in that, he talks about um, spelt builds of Ember, where you can strip out features that you're not going to use. Would the dead code elimination sort of negate the need for that? Because you could run it against your Ember app in the library code, and it could just strip away all the parts of Ember which you don't actually use. Yeah, the yeah, others potentially something can be done. So like ES6 is very declarative in what it does. So if you're using like ES6 modules or exports, then like it, it knows what you need since you've explicitly stated the parts that you're importing. Um, and so to do that kind of stuff, um, Babel kind of needs to be aware of the entire dependency graph. Um, and I've been talking with Stefan or Stefan or however you pronounce his name, um, the guy who created MCLI, um, and in how to kind of incorporate uh, more of what MCLI knows about your application into the Babel integration, um, which, yeah, will lead to kind of smaller code, <coughs> since if it can, yeah, if it has not access to your entire code base, then it can determine what's actually going to be used or not. So I guess, yeah, that, that I was in, uh, like, I'm not in the Ember world, so, like, I haven't, like, written a line of Ember in my life. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's, very potentially something that could, yeah, negate that. Question about how plugin, plugins work, because when you write a bubble plugin, yep. basically it's like you were piping the AST from the previous step to its, to its plugin. So you only convert at the end to regard code? Yeah, so if I go back to... So at the moment, um, basically plugins exist in this <coughs> layer. Um, they might potentially be able to provide like custom syntax. Um, so you could have a plugin that adds macros to your code, I guess. Um, like just kind of some language experimentation features. But yeah, it, it sits, like it can either be run, yeah, so it exists in this layer where it passes the AST and then gives the AST to a plugin, and then the plugin does its thing, and then it passes the AST back to the code generator. So I remember hearing, I can't remember if it was earlier this year or last year, about the merger, so 6 to 5 and ES next. Yep. And were there other projects involved? You kind of all plugged together behind um, 6 to 5 and then? The merger was more just like ES next dying. Yes. Yeah, and then like, Six five at the time being the thing, um, yeah. So that's kind of the one of the only things that kind of came from it. Um, another project that Babel uses for generators and async functions is um, Regenerator, mm -hmm. uh, which is a Facebook project. Um, and so yeah, that's that's used heavily for some of these features. Oh, so that's another question then. The um, the bits that have runtime components. Yeah. Uh, what's the story with that at the moment? So I haven't used them enough to really understand it because of that. Yep, so the only part that requires a runtime component is um, async functions and generator functions because they can't be easily um, compiled to ES5. Uh, for all the other features, if it needs like some extra runtime code, then it inserts it into little helpers right. that can go at the top of the, the hoisted to the top of the file. Or there's like a couple of different ways in which these helpers can be inserted. Um, there's a external helpers global script that you can just include a script and then enable a flag on Babel. And it will then, when it has to output a helper, it will reference the global. Um, there's another one where it can import um, the helpers and then reference it, the helpers that <coughs> exist in another module. And kind of, so there's a lot of, kind of ways to kind of get around this. But by default, Babel will just like include small helpers um, in your code. Is that it? I have more questions, okay. so I want to keep asking them. What's your background? Um, nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So is, is Babel a form of the artificial intelligence? <laughs> um, 
No, nah, sort of. Oh no, it can it can determine like what you it, it understands JavaScript as code. Yeah. Yes, don't tell you. Yeah. That's more than some of us can say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank yeah. you so much. Is there one more then? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah you, oh right. Oh yeah. Sorry. I'm trying to get you new to JavaScript then. So so where does this fit in? My what, what sort of basic tasks do I use it for? Uh, so, um, so have you used CSS before? Um, so where you, have you used a CSS preprocessor, um, like no. less or SAS? Yeah. This is kind of the same thing with for JavaScript. Okay. Um, where you write your JavaScript and then you pass it through this yeah. and it gives you JavaScript back out. Um, it has the like the exact similar advantages to using a CSS preprocessor. Ah, yep. So how would it work with something like Kotlin script then? It's still got a role. Sorry. It's still got a role. It doesn't replace Kotlin. Um, sort of. So a lot of the kind of features that Coffee Script provides are already kind of present in ES6. Um, and so that's kind of where the community is going to be going towards. Um, there's, there's a questionable future for CoffeeScript where a lot of what it provides is already in ES6. And since they've kind of like, the syntax is so minimal, there's a lot where you can't really add a whole lot to it um, and still keep it simple. Like stuff like the classes that CoffeeScript has kind of, some of the ways in which they work are very different to ES6 classes, so they're not really compatible. Um, and how CoffeeScript is going to kind of keep up with that, I'm not sure, but yeah. So it, CoffeeScript is more of a one-to-one -one mapping to JavaScript, almost, um, where this is kind of a bit more, it, it infers a lot more about your code and kind of transforms it on a much higher level, almost. So it'll be a replacement Yeah. Basically, yeah. But that certainly seems to be where the community's headed. Yeah, well... In, in Ember and in, like, I yep. think a lot of the frameworks are going that way. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's kind of a... If it's the standard, it's going to be, like, the future, yeah. almost, and it's kind of, like... The only real reason to use, like, CoffeeScript almost at this stage is if you just hate, like semicolons or parentheses, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is like perfectly valid, like if you don't like those and like whatever, I continue using CoffeeScript. Um, are there any ES6 features that can't be rewritten in JavaScript here next to today? Yep, so one of them, um, it's like all, all of the syntax forms can basically be compiled into ES5 or code that can run in browsers as well. <coughs> I mean, it's when you get into stuff like proxies, um, ES6 proxies where you can intercept um, like stuff like if it allows kind of a high level allows you to kind of construct these exotic objects that like if you were to get a property on that you could intercept a property access to it no matter what property it was accessing um, so typically you would set a getter but what if it accesses a property that you haven't set a getter for um, proxies would allow you to intercept kind of all that kind of stuff um, and in order to do that, it would have to be extremely intrusive in how it rewrites your code. So it would, if you were to access like just any property on an object, it would have to add in code that checks to see if that object is a proxy or not. Um, and that would lead to like extremely verbose code, um, really long code, and it would be really bad for performance. Um, so you can basically like compile anything. Since you have access to the code, it's just whether or not you can practically do it. Um, it's kind of a different question. But um, some of the stuff like the type inference that I've been looking into will allow um, potentially for that stuff to be compiled. I mean, there's more complicated features added to the language. It kind of means that the compiler needs to be smarter in how it understands the code. Uh, another question. Do you think there is any chance of things like TypeScript or Flow being rewritten as Babel plugins? Um, so at the moment, uh, Flow is just like a type checker. Yes. Um, just a static analysis engine. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of a separate thing. Um, but 
TypeScript, like, so you would use <coughs> Flow with something like Babel. Um, that's kind of, so Babel supports Flow type annotations and it strips them, so they kind of use those hand in hand. Um, so TypeScript is another thing where it could potentially be written as a Babel plugin, um, where it understands the TypeScript syntax and um, does type checking through the, the Babel plugin. Um, so yeah, you could kind of do similar kind of language experiments with uh, like TypeScript. Um, it's just where you get into whether or not it's uh, performant or not to do through um, JavaScript. So like Flow isn't written in JavaScript, it's written in OCaml. Um, and it's a separate daemon that you'll have running on your computer. Um, and so it, it, the reason that it's kind of partly why it's done that is because it, it needs to be extremely performant in how it does it and TypeScript can't infer as much information about your code since it can't be as quick almost. Um, and so yeah, you're kind of also limited to like JavaScript and the runtime. So at um, EmberConf earlier in the year, uh, Matthew Beale gave a talk about the future of JavaScript and kind of posed a, a vision where as new bits of syntax are proposed in the working groups, they will likely appear as Babel plugins in tandem. Are you, are you kind of seeing yourself getting more involved in the standards process through that, or are you happy to...? Uh, well, Babel's kind of already, <coughs> like, almost there where it's like fat. so there was like a month or so ago um, this new ES7 proposal for function bind syntax was added to Babel um, and people have been experimenting with it and providing feedback to the proposal author um, and so yeah so it provides early more early feedback to proposal authors which means that if something gets in the JavaScript language as a standard, then it's going to be have been thoroughly tested beforehand um, <coughs> through a compiler like this. So I think, like in the future, yeah, it's going to have kind of a big um, say in what's standardized. Um, are, you, are you personally kind of is that something you're even interested in to uh, have a role in the standards? Yeah, I'm definitely interested in <coughs> that kind of role in standards, cool. um, as well as like helping other people that are. In invested in the standards, so like people who are writing these proposals and allowing them to get feedback on um, their proposals and stuff like that. All right. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>